When evaluating a film like Oppenheimer, an expansive work delving into the life of the man behind the creation of the first nuclear weapons, it could very well be writer-director Christopher Nolan's most monumental and mature film to date. There is a strong temptation to examine the various intricate threads that unfurl before us. True to the Pulitzer Prize-winning biography, American Prometheus, on which it is based, the film spans decades in the life of J. Robert Oppenheimer. It primarily focuses on how he ascends to lead the Manhattan Project, wherein he endeavors to develop the weapons of mass destruction responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people when they were dropped on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. In doing so, he leaves behind a dark legacy, being one of the men who permanently reshaped the world through bloodshed and brought us to the constant brink of annihilation we face today. The film's final moments underscore this fact, with Nolan explicitly expressing it, even having a character suggest that much of what came before was relatively insignificant. As a result, any analysis of the film necessitates a deep exploration of its ending. Hence, to be clear, this piece contains major spoilers. If you haven't seen the film yet, it's best to bookmark this page and return after watching it for yourself. Providing some context, the closing scene in Oppenheimer does not take place at the furthest point in time. Instead, it revisits a scene we saw earlier from a different perspective after Oppenheimer successfully creates the atomic weapon, now viewed in a new context. The scene involves the physicist, portrayed hauntingly by Cillian Murphy in one of his finest performances, meeting with Albert Einstein by a small body of water, while Louis Strauss observes from a distance. During the initial occurrence of this scene, the two men engage in what appears to be a serious yet brief conversation, the details of which we are not privy to. All we gather is that Einstein departs, ignoring Strauss, with a sombre expression etched on his face. Subsequently, the film delves both forward and backward from this pivotal moment, thoroughly exploring how events led to this encounter and the consequences that followed. This journey encompasses the establishment of the Los Alamos Laboratory, where Oppenheimer and his colleagues toiled for years, and extends to Strauss's unsuccessful bid to become US Secretary of Commerce. While Christopher Nolan skillfully navigates both timelines, the crux of it all circles back to this one scene, revisited in the impactful closing moments, encapsulating its crushing significance. In the early stages of attempting to create the weapon, which they optimistically believed would bring an end to all future wars, Oppenheimer and his colleagues confronted the unsettling possibility that it might, in reality, annihilate everything they held dear. Despite later reassuring individuals like Leslie Dick Groves that there existed a non-zero chance of such a catastrophe, it remained a theoretical concept, leaving a pervasive sense that triggering their first test could mark their final moments. The calculations presented the alarming potential of initiating a chain reaction that could consume everything and anything in its path. This daunting prospect incessantly haunts Oppenheimer's thoughts, as he envisions the world engulfed in flames and the sound of screams engulfing everything around him in a deeply unsettling manner. The absence of such a catastrophe during their test appears to bring relief as the world continues its usual rotation. Nevertheless, while Oppenheimer attempts to distance himself from the creation he unleashed, the grim reality remains that it has irrevocably and profoundly altered life for the worse. A scene where he delivers a speech after the bomb is dropped is meant to exude triumph, but it turns horrifying as his illusions are shattered. He feigns celebration, only for us to be deafened by the screams louder than ever before. Witness the horrifying sight of flesh melting off the faces of the audience, and even observe a person's unrecognisable charred body crumbling beneath his foot. While those in the room may not have been engulfed by the hellfire of their own making, countless others suffered due to their actions. Their world technically remained intact, but for so many others, it was extinguished in an instant. All they had ever known and could have become was now lost forever. Regardless of Oppenheimer's futile attempts to undo what he had done and argue against further use of atomic weapons, it has become a Pandora's box, unleashing destructive forces he cannot seal back once they have been unleashed. In the final scene, when Oppenheimer converses with Einstein, a serene setting by the water becomes tinged with tragedy. Both men, once brimming with profound insights about the possibilities of the world, now find themselves dwelling in a world that has suffered due to the very knowledge they possessed. 
As we return to this poignant moment at the end, the long-awaited revelation of their conversation unfolds, revealing why Einstein was left shattered and speechless. Oppenheimer asks if Einstein recalls the time he had shown him the calculations that raised concerns about the potential destruction of the world. Einstein acknowledges that he indeed remembers, for such a momentous revelation could never be forgotten. The gravity of the situation intensifies as Oppenheimer solemnly reveals that they had, in fact, brought about that very destruction. The weight of these words hangs heavy in the air, causing Einstein to turn away, rendered speechless by the harsh reality of what he just learned. While Strauss had previously speculated that the conversation might have revolved around him, the truth, as now unveiled, shows that the egos of those involved mattered little in the face of the grand devastation they had unleashed. The pursuit of their own ambitions, coupled with arrogance and a disregard for the immense cost they were well aware of, culminated in the creation of a broken world we inhabit today. The consequences of their self-centered actions have left an indelible mark on history, emphasizing the profound impact of hollow accomplishments pursued at such great expense. As Oppenheimer stands alone, confronted by a final vision of the world being utterly and completely consumed by the devastating consequences of his creation, the unbridled terror of their actions remains unaltered even as he voices his acknowledgement. His empty admission comes too late for the thousands who have already perished and the countless others who could meet the same fate in an instant. In this moment, with nothing else left to be said, the stark reality of his legacy is exposed. There is no redemption, no escape from the weight of his actions, only the ominous spectre of death that he has brought upon the world. Oppenheimer centers around the life of J. Robert Oppenheimer, famously known as the father of the atomic bomb. The film commences by portraying Robert as a student facing criticism from a professor due to his struggles with the mathematical aspects of chemistry at Harvard. However, he finds guidance and inspiration while studying under Max Born, eventually earning his PhD in physics at the tender age of 22 from the University of Göttingen in Germany. Upon his return to the United States, Oppenheimer becomes aware of the lack of focus on quantum physics and takes up a teaching position at the University of California, Berkeley. It is there that he encounters various significant individuals who leave a mark on his life journey, including Jean Tatlock, with whom he has an on and off romantic relationship. Jean is not only a psychiatrist, but also a sympathizer of the communist cause. Additionally, Oppenheimer crosses paths with Nobel Prize laureate Ernest Lawrence and notably his future wife, Kitty. The relationship with Kitty leads to the birth of a child out of wedlock, adding further complexities to Oppenheimer's personal and professional life. Robert makes the pivotal decision to create an entire town in the vicinity of his hometown, Los Alamos, New Mexico. This location proves to be the perfect choice due to its remote nature and the absence of any substantial presence within a 40-mile radius, facilitating private discussions and concentrated research. Establishing the research laboratory for the Manhattan Project, Robert and Groves embark on recruiting the most brilliant scientists from around the world. Their mission revolves around developing a weapon capable of conveying a potent message. If one possesses such a weapon, so do others. The aim is to create a deterrent that could potentially save humanity by deterring aggression. During their initial breakup, Robert assures her that he will always be there to respond to her calls. However, after engaging in an affair with her while still married to Kitty, he severs ties with her. This decision is likely influenced by her association with the Communist Party, which originated during her time at Stanford, where she was involved with the Bay Area's Communist Party community. Tragically, Jean took her own life on January 5, 1994 just one day after Robert's final visit to her. Having worked under Max Born in the past, Fuchs was readily accepted into Oppenheimer's project without raising suspicions. However, this association brought about doubts regarding Robert, as some saw him as a communist sympathizer, questioning his loyalty to America despite his purely intellectual curiosity. Fuchs mainly communicated with a man named Harry Gold, through whom he passed on information about the atomic bomb and the potential development of the hydrogen bomb. Through Nolan's manipulation of the timeline, Strauss is portrayed as a sympathetic character, but his true intentions come to light as he uses Oppenheimer as a mere pawn. He strategically plans to shield himself from any adverse fallout resulting from his involvement in the commission and seeks political advantages. 
As Oppenheimer becomes more vocal in his opposition to the development of the H-bomb in his later years, Strauss devises a scheme to have his security clearance taken away. So that's all from today's video. If you enjoyed it, remember to leave a like, subscribe and ring that bell icon so you never miss our upcoming videos. And don't forget to share your thoughts in the comments section. Stay tuned and we will catch you in the next video.